let's look again at what does it mean to take the lead? We've learned that as a follower of Christ, it is your God-given mandate to take the lead. That leadership is not for them, it's for you. In fact, when God made man in Genesis 126, we learn that he put it in our DNA to take leadership. So regardless of what your personality style is like, you may be an extrovert, you may be an introvert, it really doesn't matter. Either way, God created you in Genesis 1:26. it says, so that you will rule on the earth. You're supposed to exercise some leadership and take dominion. So everybody has a call to leadership in some way. And doesn't so much of life hinge on leadership? I mean, the direction a home goes often provide, is, is uh, spoken of by the leadership that's provided in that home. Where a business often goes speaks of the leadership that's provided there. It's true in a city. It's true in a nation. So, so much of life hinges on leadership, and God calls you to be part of leadership. I want to talk today about something important for every leader. And, and by the way, it is my goal and mission, knowing we're living in the last of the last days, to raise up kingdom-minded leaders in these last days. I'm convinced that God's looking for great leaders in these last final days as we know earth as we know it now. So I want to raise up leaders. And one thing every leader has to face is their thinking. I want to talk to you today about the power of renewing your mind. Years ago, I, Renee and I took a team of students, not Australia. We did that a different year. This was Costa Rica we took a team to uh, on a missions trip. We had a phenomenal time of ministry uh, for about 10 days. Then we had one day off. And the missionary, a good friend, Jason Friend is his name, he took us to a beach on our day off. And, uh, and he told us, you know, in the midst of all the beauty, it was absolutely beautiful. Uh, he said, you have to be careful of the water. And there were signs warning, riptide. You got to be careful. The water, in the midst of all the beauty, the water can be dangerous. And I learned that in a couple different ways. One, the force, which is how a, a riptide, this unseen current happens when the, the waves with such force hit the shore and then they pull back out. They, they hit with such force that when I was just, I was just, you know, I, I swam for a while and I was just going to come out of the water, get on the beach, and just walking up toward the shore, those waves hit me with such force, it, it drove me underneath the water and like slammed me against the, the ocean floor. I thought, Ow! Like, that's not like Florida where you just walk out of the water. There's just little wave. It, it was powerful. And then they warned us, be really careful because there's this riptide, this unseen current. And, and I've learned that in one minute, that current can carry you 500 feet from the shore. Just real quickly, real quickly. So be really careful, that riptide. And some people's lives are like that. Their lives end up being pulled in a direction they don't want it to go. How does that happen? It's the unseen area of their mind. It's the way they think. That's why God's word tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we're called to renew our mind. That with God's help to change the way that we think. So here's a couple of questions for you today. First, is your life heading in the direction you want it to go? Is your, is your current belief system taking you to the place that you really want to go in life? Do you, or do you find yourself um, recircling some issues, kind of going around the block over and over again, and you're not sure why that seems to continue? Often it's because of this unseen area of your mind. It's the way that you think. Think about this. Even with the children of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt for years, 400 and some years. So even when they were free, they had changed their location, but they hadn't changed their thinking. And so even though they were free now, when Moses led them out of Egypt, they still acted like slaves. They still thought like slaves. So here's the thing. You can physically change your location, but until you deal with that unseen part of your life, the mind, the way you think, you can still act in a way that God has already pulled you out of that. Does that make sense? So let's look at God's word together. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. Don't copy, and I'm reading this in the New Living Translation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Or don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Don't be conformed to or don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Paul was writing 
to Christians. He was writing to Christians in Rome, those that were followers of Christ. So these are people that had crossed the line of faith. They believe that they can't save themselves and that all have sinned and everybody needs a savior. So they cross that line of faith. They put their, their faith not in how good they are, but how good God is and what Jesus did for them on the cross when he died, was buried, and rose from the dead. So speaking to Christians, he said, hey, there's some, there's some behaviors and customs that you should not conform to. You shouldn't copy certain things that are in this world. Why not? Well, here's why not, because if you're a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, this is not your home. And isn't that really good news? Like, aren't you glad? If you're a follower of Christ, aren't you glad this is not it? This is not all there is? Like, all we got going on would be this? And then six feet under, if that was all there was, oh my, how bad that would be. Seriously, you mean this is it? I'm glad this is not it. The writer of Hebrews said this, for this world is not our permanent home. We're looking forward to a home yet to come. You know, the good news, one of the many good news uh, pieces about that is this. There is an expiration date for every trial that you face. Hey, whatever you're going through, this isn't it. It's going to come to an end. There is an expiration date for every trial that you face. This home is not your home. This world is not the world you're really from. You have a citizenship somewhere else. Peter said this in 1 Peter 2.11. He said, dear friends, I warn you as a temporary resident and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very own souls. 1 Peter 2.11. Dear friends, I warn you. you know, the Apostle Paul is saying, warning, don't be conformed to this world. It's a big warning sign. There's an there's a unseen current, the way people think and the way things are done in this world that you don't want to be attached to. And you don't want to let that take you somewhere that you don't want to go. So I warn you. Philippians 1.27, the Apostle Paul said, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. So it's interesting to be a follower of Christ and live in this world because we realize this isn't our home, right? We're just temporary residents here. This is but a blip on the radar compared to all of eternity. This is a testing ground of faithfulness for the next assignment we receive in that life. So this is all temporary here, and yet we live here. So the warning is, hey, in the way you think and the custom and behaviors of this world, don't copy that. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Now, some people say that, hey, you know, for Christians, it's really time that you, you get up to speed. You know, things have changed. you got to stop being so old school. And, uh, you know, some have taken the Bible and they've said, you know, th this part sounds good. This part seems kind of old school and outdated, so we'll just rip that part out. I mean, you can look at my Bible, and there are pages that are missing. It's not because I've ripped them out. My dog chewed them out. <laughs> but there are some that they have just ripped them out and decided, I just, they just decide that I think that's not for today anymore because times have changed. Well, I got, I got news for you. God's standard, his word, has never changed. It has never changed. It always is solid. It's something you can stand on. And never is a follower of Christ supposed to change the standards of God's word to match up with the times when we live in this world that really is not even our home. We're just here for a little while. Can't think the same way everybody else does. Isaiah 8:11 said, hey, here's another strong warning. God said to Isaiah, don't think like everybody else. Every leader in the kingdom has got to come to grips with the way they think. And as a follower of Christ, your thinking ought to be significantly different. So let's pause and stop here for a minute and talk about this. So how does a Christian vote? Let's go there for just a minute. Okay, because we're 20-some days away. There'll be an election. We will have the next president of the United States. So important to talk about for a second because we're told that this is not our home. So even though we are, we are from a different world, we get to vote in this world. 
So how, do, how does a Christian do that? Because we're not supposed to copy the behaviors and customs. We're not supposed to be conformed to this world. So how does a Christian vote? I would say first, I would say this. The customs of this world are to be a Republican or a Democrat, Libertarian. You've you got to pick, you pick a party and say, I am that. I tell you what, I'm not a Democrat, and I'm not a Republican. I am a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm not a Democrat, not a Republican. The custom of this world is you, know, you pick your party. We have two candidates right now, one Democrat, one Republican, that will be the next president. So how does a Christian vote? I think it would be healthy to take off whatever hat you wear. If you wear a Democrat hat or Republican hat, take that off and say, wait, I am a, I am first and foremost a Christian who is not from this world, but I do get to vote. I do have a say and actually should exercise influence in this world because we're called as a Christian to be salt and light, to have influence in the world that we live in. Tracking me so far? I think that would be good for us to do that. Take off all your filters. If you need help doing that, ask the Holy Spirit to help you take off all your filters so everything you hear isn't, isn't through uh, that party or this person filter. Second thing I think would be healthy for how a Christian should vote is you've got to look beyond the people and the personalities and look at a platform that they stand on. You know what a platform is? A platform is something you stand on. And I would encourage you, I've had people tell me, Pastor Kev, but I don't like him and I, or I don't like her. Well, you know, pfft. It's probably a lot of people don't like whatever. But I would encourage you, do this. Look beyond the person because each person that we will be electing in a short amount of time, they're standing on a platform. And that platform comes with an agenda that will be pursued at least for the next four years. On top of that, they will be appointing a Supreme Court judges who will affect not only the next few years, will affect years and years to come, affecting our kids, our grandkids. So I would encourage you to look at the platform they're standing. What is the agenda they're going to push? They will pursue for the next four, at least four years. Maybe you've never done, maybe you've never looked at the actual platforms these candidates stand on. You can Google it. You can Google a Republican. Someone asked me after the 8 o'clock, well, how do you do that? You Google. Google Republican platform or Democrat platform, and it'll pull up exactly what it is. And this is the agenda. Look beyond the person. What's the platform? What's going to be pursued? And then you've got to say, which platform is going to look most like the kingdom? Which one represents the kingdom the most? Again, taking off your, your hats and saying, I am a Christian from another world, but I've got to vote in this world. So what would most represent what the kingdom looks like, that would be really helpful to do. It might, maybe it's even good that, that the candidates, you know, I've heard it said several times, that these are the most unlike candidates in a long, long, long time. So maybe that's, maybe that's kind of good because it will force you to look beyond the candidate. Maybe, maybe for the first time, it would require some to actually look at the platform, that agenda that will be pursued for years to come. So I encourage you, look at the platform. Everybody's good so far? This is interesting. When Scripture says, don't be conformed to this world, that word conformed or also copy behaviors and customs means to attach yourself to by association. And I've got to tell you, I've taken time to read these platforms, and there are some things in the platforms, in the agenda that will be pursued, for, at least for the next four years, that I do not want to be associated with. I don't want to be attached to that. I don't want to attach myself to that by association. I don't want to be part of that. Why? Because I am not of this world. I think differently. I'm kingdom-minded. And that alone, just knowing you are kingdom-minded, you are a child of the king, I'm telling you, what does the kingdom look like? There's joy, there's peace, full of the Holy Spirit. And that means you ought to be so different than everybody else. I'm talking specifically, as you can tell already, specifically to Christians this morning, because that's who Paul was addressing, Christians. So if you're not a follower of Christ yet, this is really good for you. Because you get to hear what Christians are really supposed to be like 
We're supposed to represent the kingdom, which is known for peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So when a Christian walks in a room and everybody else is all depressed and they're all mad, you ought to bring in some joy. If a Christian walks in, joy ought to walk in the room. A big smile ought to walk in the room. The atmosphere should begin to shift just because you walked in the room. So let's go a little bit further. And I would like to take, we only have, I think, three Sundays before the election. So I'm going to plan on taking maybe just five minutes or so uh, every week before the election to talk about one issue on these platforms. Because I have found some issues specifically that I do not want to attach myself to. You look and you decide for you. But for myself, there are some issues that I don't want to attach myself to. I don't want to be part of pursuing that and pushing that agenda for the next four years and then some. One of those would have to be, and obvious to me that stood out, is the agenda of abortion. And let me pause real quickly. Hold, hold on for just a second. Hold on real quickly, because right, right away when I, when I thought to share this, just to be helpful, I am so aware that here today there, there are ladies that have had an abortion. There's husbands, uh, men that have said, you should have an abortion. And, and I want to say this to every person who's had an abortion, or you've got a close friend or family member that has had an abortion, um, I, it grieves me deeply to know that people in the name of Christ I've heard have held up signs calling you a murderer at like an abortion clinic or a place like that. Like, you're a murderer. I, that is so not like Jesus Christ. Uh, God loves you. And God gives all of us, not just you, all of us amazing grace so when any of us made a call that did not line up with God's agenda, we have access through Jesus Christ to amazing, rich, extravagant grace. And in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. Zero. I've talked to ladies that have had an abortion, and they've cried. And, and for some, for years, they've carried guilt and shame. And I just want to say to you that Jesus carried guilt and shame on the cross so you would never have to carry guilt and shame. So if you've been carrying that, I want to encourage you that today is a day of freedom for you. Today's your day to no longer carry guilt or shame, but experience the freedom, the peace, the joy that we have, the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ. Abortion. I don't see that lining up. In fact, um, I, I find it... Um, Absolute lunacy, again, we're not supposed to copy because it's now a behavior and custom of how things are done in this world. It's become a behavior and custom in some cases that just really make me go, don't get it. That, that we would have more concern over a frog that might be an endangered species or an eagle. And hey, I'm all, I love animals. Before I was going to be a pastor, I wanted to be a veterinarian because I love animals. So I get, I, I'm fine with that. But to take care of an animal because they're vulnerable, but not take care of the most vulnerable of all, an unborn child, I can't see that that's good. I can't be okay with that. I can't, I can't attach myself to that platform to push that. In Michigan and 37 other states, if a woman is pregnant and somebody harms the child inside of her and that child dies, that's considered a crime because that's a life, that's a baby, that's a human being in there. And this, isn't, this is what's crazy. It, I'm not talking about abortion and trying to save a, a mother's life who's in danger, a choice between one or the other. I'm not talking about anything like that. We're, what America's talking about is to continue to push an agenda to provide abortions for the sake of convenience. It's just not convenient for me to have this child. So for that reason, I want to, this was so, it, it just stood in such stark contrast to me in the year 2011 when Renee and I were in Washington, D.C. And I saw the statue of Nathan Hale. He was killed 21 years old. And he was killed because during the American Revolution, uh, he was caught trying to make America free. And so in the statue that I'm looking at, they've got him in handcuffs. He's spread out like this with chains on his hands, his feet. His shirt is ripped open in the statue. 
because they're getting ready to hang him. And he's looking like this, looking at those that will hang him in what he said is those famous lines, my only regret is I only have one life to give for my country. And I'm thinking, wow, that's so amazing. I'm looking at that, 21 years old. Some of the most courageous people in American history have been 21-year-olds. They've been young people. They've been young adults. And, and Nathan Hill was one of them. And then in contrast to that, the same day on the sidewalk are all these young, about 21-year-old girls holding picket signs saying, don't take my abortion. But how did we get here? How did we go from, I regret I only have one life to give, to don't take away my right to kill, to take away life? How? That's just what I was thinking. How did we get here? Pastor Kev, does God really care about abortion or are you just being political? Listen, I am the most non-political person that you'll probably ever meet. I thank God for those that God has called and I, and I think we need godly leaders in places of government. I'm glad we need godly leaders in our schools and so I'm glad, but that's just not me. But this is what I find in God's word, that God does have a say about this. In fact, as early as Exodus chapter 21, verse 22, God said that if a woman is pregnant and somebody, men are fighting, if they injure, if they injure that baby, that baby dies, that's a crime. So going way back to what God said in Exodus, God said that's a crime. It has always been, for years, it had always been, for years, considered a crime in America. Why? Because America was based with this as the standard. This was the foundation, and that's the reason we have so many of our laws in America. Psalms 139.13 says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. The Lord said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. And of course, Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give life, abundant, rich, satisfying life. Jeremiah 6, 16, this is so good. I think it's important in this time in American history. Jeremiah 6, 16 says this. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel this, this path and you will find rest for your souls. Today we're at a crossroads. It's a picture of, of a guy walking around and he's gotten off course. And you know, you know what, what most guys do if they're lost, they just keep going. And he's saying, hey, you got to stop, stop. Stop for a minute. Look around. Try and figure out how you got here. And then ask for the old godly way. Ask for the old godly path. Walk down that path, and down that path, you will find rest for your souls. So you call me old-fashioned, call me old-school, call me whatever you want. I'm just asking for the old godly path. I'm asking for the old godly way, the old godly standard. I want to walk down that path because down that path, there's rest for my soul. Down that path, there's rest for your soul. All good? I just want to practically give you something from God's word every week until, until we hit these elections, okay? So let's come back to this, Romans 12 too. Don't copy the behavior, this is read in the New Living Translation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think or by renewing your mind. Fundamental, fundamental to every leader's success is the renewing of the mind. It is the changing of the way we think. It seems like ever since the fall of man, people have had this slide toward negativity. Have you ever been around somebody like that? You make the mistake of asking them, how are you doing? And they say, oh, well, I stubbed my toe last week and it got infected and an ingrown toenail, I had to get the yank yanked out. And Oh, and then my dog, like they broke their leg and my hair is falling out. I don't know why. If it's not, if it's not one thing, it's the other. It's, ah! Don't you just want to say, stop, stop. 
Some just say, well, I'm just a pessimist. Well, stop, stop. Listen, you were, you were made by God to think positively. You were made by God. If you're born again, you have the mind of Christ. And so you can teach yourself to think negatively. It's taught. You teach yourself to think negatively, but you were created by God to think positively. And, and some of the greatest leaders I know are people, regardless of what they face, they think positively. They think and believe the sky is the limit. So we're talking about how to renew your mind. How does that happen? Dr. Carolyn Leaf wrote two great books I really would encourage you to get a hold of and read. The first book is called, Who Shut Off My Brain? This is Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Who Shut Off My Brain? Doesn't that just sound intriguing right there? The next book is, How Do You Turn On Your Brain? And she teaches in these two books. Renee's the one that shared this with me. Now, I wonder why she shared those with me. <laughs> I never thought of that until right now. What were you thinking? You shut off your brain. She says in her book that negative thinking, what she calls toxic thinking, it writes grooves in your brain. It changes your brain. Did you know that, that negative, toxic thinking actually physically shapes and changes your brain? It throws you into a state of stress. Negative, toxic thinking throws your whole body into a state of stress. Association between stress and disease is 85%, and 75 to 98% of mental, physical, and behavior illnesses comes from a person's thought life the way you think. So to be a leader from God's kingdom in the earth today, you've got to deal with this, getting your mind renewed, having the Holy Spirit help change the way that you think. In fact, uh, the way a person thinks is one of the number one factors in helping you reach your destiny. You have a God-given destiny. You have a God-given dream. There's a something on the earth, according to Ephesians 2.10, that God created you to do. God has a big dream for you. And one of the biggest factors to keep you from that dream is the way that you think. Think about this. Think of the uh, 10 spies we, spies we read about in the book of Exodus, right? God said, we're gonna go take this, they call it the promised land. You're pulled out of Egypt, we're slaves. I've got something better for you. There's this promised land. And so we're gonna send 10 spies to go check out how good this land is, 12 spies. And so 10 of them came back. If you're familiar with this, you know the 10 came back and said, oh my, we can't do this. They had toxic thinkings. They said to themselves, stop right there. What do you say to yourself? Do you know what you say to yourself? Your self-talk can either propel you into that God-given destiny or be like an anchor around your neck that will forever hold you back. So they said to themselves, hey, we're just like grasshoppers. We can't do anything. There's no way we can do this. And because of the way they thought, they never did see that great destiny God had planned for them. It's critical as leaders that we take seriously having the Holy Spirit's help to renew our thoughts. How can that happen? How can you have this, this changing of the way you think, what the Bible calls the renewal of the mind? Number one, real quickly, is you've got to be born again. Be born again. At, rather, Ephesians 4.23 says, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Let, that's a key word, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. If you don't have that underlined or circled in your Bible, you should do that under that word let, because it means you have an invitation to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, to let Him, let the Holy Spirit change the way you think and your attitudes. Do you know the Holy Spirit is relentlessly working to change the way you think? He is relentless at working in you what Galatians 5 calls the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we just have to cooperate with him. He loves you so much that when you start to enter into stinking thinking, he will say, hey, you ought not to go there. That's a bad place to go. You can, you can choose to either cooperate with him. Say, oh, thank you. You can cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Do you know that whatever you respond to, you become sensitive to? Whatever you ignore, you become hardened to. So the more you respond to the Holy Spirit helping change the way you think, like you, you start letting your mind go crazy, oh my, and what about this? And the Holy Spirit says, hey, stop. 
You shouldn't go there. If you respond to that, you become more sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We have some neighbors in our neighborhood that have dogs, and dogs that love to bark early, early, early in the morning. It's sometimes nonstop. I don't know why they go absolutely psycho, and I'm thinking, why won't the neighbors stop them? Like, it just seems like a courteous thing to do at 3.30 in the morning to say, you know, make your dog stop barking. Stop! But they don't. Why don't they? I think they don't because they probably don't even hear it. They have ignored it so many times, it's just life to them. So I encourage you, let the Holy Spirit help you by simply responding to his gentle proddings and help as he offers that. Number three, carefully, or that number two rather, choose your thoughts carefully. Choose your thoughts very carefully. You get to choose your thoughts. You can't choose what thoughts pop in there, but you get to choose what thoughts you're going to think about, what, what thoughts you're going to let run amok on the inside of your mind. Choose your thoughts carefully. You have to accept full responsibility for your own mind. Your parents may have been negative. They may have created a disposition in you, but not a destiny. Right? So you've got to take responsibility for your own mind the way that you think. Paul said in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, and whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. You get to choose what you're going to think about. And you tend to bring about what you think about, so choose your thoughts carefully. You know, when you choose your thoughts carefully, it's like you're, according to Dr. Carolyn Leaf, it's like you're doing brain surgery on yourself. You're rewriting and reshaping your brain the way God made it to be. Colossians 3.15 says that we should let the peace that comes from Christ rule our hearts. There's that word let again. You, you can let, you can choose every day. Talk about the way you think. Every day, you can choose fear or worry, or you can choose peace. You get to choose what you think about. And when we let the peace that comes from Christ rule our hearts. You know what? That word rule means umpire. And I love this picture because I know Renee likes baseball. I really don't, but I'd watch it with her now and then. And uh, to me, it's pretty boring to watch, especially if you've got a really good pitcher. But I love to watch. The only thing I love about watching baseball is to watch the umpires because they're so dramatic. Maybe because they're so bored. I really don't know. But it's like, if it's, a, if it's a out, you know, umpires are like, hey, he's out. They're always like, he's out of here. Like, what is he? Why is he going nuts? I don't even know. But he's just so like, it's so obvious. Strike! Or whatever they do. They're just always so dramatic. And so when I read that verse in Colossians 3.15, let the peace that comes from Christ dramatically rule over your heart. Dramatically make the call as to what should be in there and what should not be in there. Choose your thoughts carefully. Number three, reject all the toxic thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We're taking thoughts captive to be obedient to Christ. There are some thoughts that shouldn't be left to run around. They really should be held captive. And so part of, as a leader, is you've got to take a responsibility and actually take captive some thoughts. Don't let them just run amok in your life. Toxic thoughts like, I'm never going to amount to anything. I'm no good with money. Nothing good ever seems to happen to me. Those are toxic thoughts that you've got to reject and refuse to let come into your mind to stay there and let alone to come out of your mouth as well. Here's something interesting for leaders. For every leader that God has given a big dream to, there, between the time God gives you a dream and the time that dream becomes a reality is always time. And during that time, it's very critical how you think during that time. Your thinking is critical. Uh, Psalms 105.19 says, Until the time came 
for Joseph's dreams to become a reality. Until that time came, God was testing Joseph's character. So it's like what he was doing during that time, the way he thought during that time. Like, I'm wondering, what was Joseph thinking after he received this awesome dream from God and then finds himself sold as a slave? That wasn't part of the dream. Then he finds himself unjustly accused of going after the hoochie mama lady. So he's thrown in prison for three years. What's he thinking about? I don't know. If it was me, I'd be thinking, wait a minute, this was not in the plan. What was Moses thinking about? When Moses, God said, Moses, you're going to take the children into this promised land. And, and after all those plagues, they come out of Egypt, and all of a sudden he's facing a Red Sea on this side, and those angry Egyptians coming at that side. I'd be thinking, wait a minute. This, this wasn't, like, what about, what about what you said? Like, wait a minute, what about all those plagues and all that stuff happened and this? It can't end like this. You know, I, don't, I don't know what he was thinking, but I know leaders have to think that there's a time that will come when that dream will become a reality. Until that time comes, guard your thoughts. Like, reject toxic thinking. Latch on to what God has said. Live there. If you don't know what God has said, you'll always be at the mercy of what you see. Right? If Moses couldn't come back to you, well, God, you said he would live at the mercy of all he could see, that Red Sea, right? All those angry Egyptians. I want to encourage you. God has given you a dream. Hold on to that. Great leaders guard. I'm, I'm glad I have a wife that helps me. If I ever get to stinking thinking, Renee lets me know. She loves me enough to help me. Reject toxic thoughts. And then number four, we'll end with this. Uh, Every day, take 5 to 15 minutes every day to cause your thoughts to line up with God's Word. This is so, I mean, 5 to 15 minutes every day to take a look at your life and line it up with what God has to say. Not just with what you see, what does God say? So if you see sickness in your body, okay, well, take time to line that up with God's Word, who says, by His stripes we were healed. Okay, I'm lining up with what I'm lining up with, with God what you have to say. You are the Lord my healer, and by your stripes I am healed. Whew. Wouldn't that be a good thing to do? Oh, there's five areas of my life that I, I try on a daily basis to go over and look at look at what God has to say, not just what I see. Those areas are the man. That's just me. Kevin Barry is a child of God. God, what do you got to say about me? I love to go there. I love to, I love to line up my thoughts with what God has to say about the man, Kevin Barry. I love to, to then look at my marriage, my family, my marriage with Renee, my beautiful wife, uh, with Sarah and John, their kids. God, what do you have to say about my family? What does your word say about my family? What are all the good intentions, the plans that you have for my marriage and my family? I want to line up my thoughts with what you have to say. It's healthy to do. For me, the third is the ministry God has called me to, Mount Hope Church. God, what do you got to say about Mount Hope? What, I want to line up my thoughts with what you're thinking. Oh, what did you say? You said, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 11, that it is your intention to make Mount Hope a thousand times more. Thank you, Lord, that that's what you're going to do. And then I do the same with my friends, friendships. I learned that in a leader's life, friendships matter. King David, a great leader in the Bible, friendships were valuable to him. I read today in 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul, probably it was the last letter that he wrote, stuck in a, a dungeon, chains around him, just a little light at the very top. And what did he do? He wrote, not this time a church, but he wrote a friend, Timothy. And in this letter to Timothy, he wrote about a person who had expressed a lot of kindness to him. And he said, I'm praying that on the day the Lord Jesus returns, that God's going to show special kindness to that person who was kind to me. And so I began to pray that for my friends. Lord, these people have been so kind to me. I call you out by name. Lord, I pray that today in this life and Jesus, when you return, you will show them special kindness because of the kindness, the encouragement that they have shown me. Then lastly, for me, the other area that I want to line up with God's word is uh, finances. Because I'm a steward, not an owner. So God, with, with what you've, the finances you've entrusted to me, I want to be a good steward of that. So I want to line up my life with what you have to say. And your word says that I'll have no lack. Psalms 34.10. 
There'll be no lack. You're the Lord of my shepherd. I will, have, I will not want. And the word of God says, you'll, you'll bless me generously so that I can be generous and be a blessing to others. So why not take five to 15 minutes every day and line up your life with what God's word has to say and then speak that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to gather in your house today. And Lord, I pray that is people that you've called to take the lead in these last days, that we would never be ones that look to others to lead but miss our opportunity to exercise leadership in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, in this church, in the community that you've placed us in. So Lord, I'm asking that you would work in us every good thing that we need to be leaders that would represent your heart, our words, our thoughts, and our actions would represent your kingdom in the earth today.